This is Bloomberg Business Week. Insight from the reporters and editors who bring you America's most trusted business magazine. Plus, global business, finance, and tech news. The Bloomberg Business Week podcast with Carol Messer and Tim Stenebeck from Bloomberg Radio. All right, everybody, to say that a lot has happened since we last checked in with our next guest would be an understatement, uh, big time. Ori Levine last joined us earlier this year before the October 7th Hamas attack on Israel. Ori, as you know, uh, many um, is the co-founder, of course, of the navigation app Waze, which Google bought for more than $1.1 billion. He was also an investor in Move It, which then Tim Intel bought for a billion dollars. We last spoke to him uh, because of his new book, Fall in mm-hmm. Love with the Problem, Not the Solution, a handbook for entrepreneurs. It details his journey and also his unique philosophy on what it takes to be a successful innovator. He's a graduate from the Tel Aviv University uh, and served in the Israeli Army Special Intelligence Unit. He started both Ways and Move It companies in Israel, which of course is currently at war with Hamas in the Gaza Strip. Ori, good to have you back here in the Bloomberg Interactive Brokers studio. Um, how are you doing? You know, it's, it's complicated, right? Because um, it's never going to be the same. It's never going to be the same. That was a devastating attack. That was, uh, you know, my kids are the age between 22 and 33. They could have been at this party. And there were many days that that was my main thought of the day, that I'm lucky that they weren't. Mm. That was devastating. And I think that at the end of the day, if you look into the future, you realize that uh, there might be a solution, but without Hamas being there. Well, that's what we think about. Um, we talk a lot about the way forward. Uh, I've talked to people, I feel like on both sides, and not when I say sides, I don't mean on Hamas' side, but I mean on the uh, Palestinian point of view, the Israeli point of view, about how do we go forward? How do we stop that? We don't find five years from now, 10 years, we're still talking about conflict in that region. How do you think about that? So look, at the end of the day, if you think about the Palestinians in Gaza Strip and you ask yourself whether or not Hamas was doing any good for them, not really. They were doing very good for themselves, Mm -hmm. but not for the people. Um, And and look, Israel left the Gaza Strip some 17, 18 years ago. There was an opportunity to build awesomeness there. And Hamas took over and basically this is a terrorist organization, right? Their only agenda that they have is to kill us. And that doesn't work. We guess what? We don't want to be to get killed. Can I ask you? And I, I feel like this is such a difficult conversation. We've had it a lot of times in the newsroom. Tim and I have talked a lot of times after a show or after a guest. Um, you know, this concept. I I get it of having to fight back, but this concept of killing and then more killing, and it's just like, where does it stop, or how does it stop? And how do you justify that on both sides? I, I understand. I, I, so, you know. so number one, I'm, you know, I'm not the prime minister. It's not me that needs to make those decisions. But at the end of the day, if you realize that um, um, if, if Hamas is being removed from the region, then there are opportunities for something else completely different, right? Because at the end of the day, most people prefer living over dying, right? In most of the people in the Gaza Strip, it's the same for them. Uh, the challenge is that the leadership of the Hamas uh, is the one that is basically enjoying the uh, the killing on one hand and the power in particular that they have. And I think that once they are being removed, there is an opportunity. And I see major role of the U.S., major role of uh, Saudi Arabia um, they are helping to recreate something new in the Middle East. And well, talk, that- talk a little bit about that, because that's a, a part of the equation that I'm having trouble seeing here, the solution and, and, and what actually happens. And it sounds like you think Hamas can be removed from power. So let's say Hamas is successfully removed from power in the Gaza Strip. Um, what would you like to see happen? So, um, so again, we, we have to realize that what I would like to see has, uh, I have zero influence on that, or maybe a little bit of influence, but that's about it. But I think that the opportunity here is that really you're recreating something new with the support of the American, with the support of uh, the Saudis, and basically say establishing sort of uh, um, um, normalizations in the relationship, right? Now, if you look at the history of Israel, 
every time there was a major crisis, two things happened. Number one, Israel grew up stronger. Number two, we actually figure out a way, a different way, right? That's true for the uh, Yom Kippur War back in 73, and after that we had a peace with Egypt, right? And that's true for World War II, where the Holocaust happened, and after that there was a Jewish uh, state, right? And so at the end of the day, I think that uh, October 7th is, uh, is such a major crisis that it will lead into something else. And, and uh, you know, uh, hopefully as soon as possible, right? But uh, when is that going to happen? We don't know. Do you believe, I mean, you work with individuals in Palestine or in the, in the, in the Strip, or in Gaza Strip? <clears throat> Um, not specifically, but with, uh, um, you know, other nations in the region, yes. What I, I guess what I'm curious about is why, why we haven't been able to figure out a two-state solution up to this point. I would say that you have to ask the leadership that. I think that at the end of the day... But um, is that a solution? You're a smart man. Ah, you, want, you You actually think out of the box well, obviously, and how to change things. Obviously, so. it is, right? At the yeah. end of the day, uh, look... Hamas really created severe poor and poor people in the Gaza Strip. Right? When you are poor and you have no hope, you have nothing to lose. Right. If you create something else, if people have something to lose, then they would prefer peace over war. Time after time in the history when people have something to lose, then they actually prefer the stability rather than the instability. And in many cases, this is, uh, uh, you know, the craziness of the leadership that leads into acts of war, right? So we can see the same thing with uh, Russia and Ukraine, and we have seen that throughout uh, many uh, cases in Europe, in the Middle East, in other places. So what do you think of when people say, you talk about Russia and Ukraine, and Tim and I, you know, we've had a lot of discussions with individuals, this idea of that we are so opposed to the Russian occupation of Ukraine, and then people say, well, why aren't you similarly upset about the Israel, uh, Israeli occupation of Gaza? Israel is not occupying Gaza. Gaza is a free place for the last uh, Israel withdrawn from Gaza Strip some 17 or 18 years ago. We are not occupying Gaza. Hamas is occupying Gaza. What would you say is the prevailing view within your social circle about the way this ends? Sorry, can, can you repeat yeah, that? Yeah, what's the, what's the conversation that you're having with your fellow entrepreneurs, with your friends, with your family right now about the way this ends? So, um, in general, I would say um, tough time creates stronger people. Stronger people then creates better times, right? And Israel is in under tough time right now. Entrepreneurs are going to be the first one to recover, and they will be recovering strongly and better after that. Because what happened during war is that, uh, um, forget all the, the horror things that happens in a war. After the war, people are way stronger. And they realize that there is a different choice for them, which is leaving. And they realize that uh, uh, now, if they survive that, they can survive anything. We're pleased to have back with us Ori Levine to continue our conversation. Uh, as many of you know, he's the co-founder of the navigation app Waze. Google bought it for more than $1.1 billion, more than a decade ago at this point. Also an investor in MoveIt, which Intel bought for a billion dollars. We're going to get to um, how he's thinking about startups right now, uh, especially in Israel, where he built these two companies in just a second. But I do want to continue the conversation that we were having earlier about the environment there right now in the wake of uh, the October 7th attack uh, from Hamas. Um, I want to talk economy a little bit because I don't think people understand that when people get called back to the military, they leave their jobs to go back uh, to uh, the Israeli military. So there's a whole element of the Israeli economy that's not working the way that it should right now. Are you seeing the effects of that day to day? that there is a shortage of workers, that there are a lot of people who, I mean, I have friends on Facebook who, who, who've posted, Israelis who've said, you know, my husband is away uh, fighting right now because he got called back. Uh, she's a tour operator who does restaurant tours for tourists. There's no tourists there mm -hmm. right now. So she literally, they, they literally have no income coming in right now as a result of this. <coughs> so, so not exactly, because uh, when you're doing your military reserve, you do, you do get, uh, from the social security, the same pay that you would have gotten if you were working. But um, 
if you look at the impact of the war on the economy, then then I would say for a second, uh, obviously budget for security and uh, is going to go up dramatically, and that's we all realize the war costs money, right? Um, some markets, some industries are completely suffering from that, right? Like tourism, right? There is there are, there are no tourists going to Israel, right? Um, and and I don't blame them, right? They shouldn't. It's there is a war there, and they uh, don't feel safe, and that's okay. High tech industry is actually getting stronger because mm. what we are realizing is that the people that are still there, they are carrying the load um, for all the people that are going on the military reserve and so forth. And uh, what we have seen is that uh, the productivity increased dramatically. And when people will be coming back from the military uh, reserve, then we are likely to see huge growth in the in the high tech in general. Um, the challenge right now for the high tech, the Israeli high tech, that it's harder to raise capital, right? So most of the investors will prefer to be on the fence and uh, um, and you know wait to see that the war is over, right? Investing in a war zone. Eh, people afraid and they rightly so that's, that's interesting to hear because you've also got a group of very vocal Americans who are happy to give to Israeli causes and I would think that some of those would be supportive of venture capital of uh, course they will. in in the country they, to kind they, of help prop it up during they, a time they of, do and they will uh, but they, but in general if you look at the um, you know, non-Jewish investors or non-engaged investors then they have a more challenging time not all of them, but a lot. Or is there anything you've put on hold? Because that's home base for you, correct, Israel? Or So I, you know, I keep on building. My, look, I, I have a very simple life. I have a mission. I have a destiny. I have a purpose. And this is about value creation, right? And I can create value through multiple ways, through, you know, building startups that help people, uh, through, um, um, you know, coaching and mentoring a group of CEOs that uh, of my startups uh, through teaching and through, you know, the ultimate way of teaching is uh, the book itself. They fall in love with the problem, not the solution. The book is, by and large, it's, this is sharing my know-how with people and um, hopefully make them more successful. What's a problem that you see right now that needs to oh, be solved when you're working? <laughs> there are a lot take of problems. Take your pick, Tim. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Take a pick. You know, so the... The good news is that there are a lot of problems. The bad news is that there are a lot of problems, right? <laughs> End of the day, there are a lot of problems. One of the, um, you know, major problems that we are addressing recently is actually in the U.S. the realization that most people will not have enough saving for retirement, and so Pontera is one of the companies that is uh, helping that in the U.S. help people to eventually retire richer. Um, and and so this is and this is a big problem. At the end of the day, when people get old and they don't have enough money, this is a big problem. Uh, so this is one of the things that I'm trying to do with uh, my startups, um, and uh, um, you know, dealing with uh, parking. Parking is a major problem mm -hmm. right now. In general, you would say, wait a minute. In the U.S., it's less of a problem because. Most people live in a single-family house, and they have a driveway, and they have a parking garage. But rest of the world, most people live in uh, multi-family houses, multi-story houses, and they don't have parking garage. And then looking for parking at the end of the day is a nightmare. And this is, uh, you know, my most recent startup that uh, we started that a couple of years ago, and uh, and it's still in Israel. Um, and uh, um, and hopefully it will grow to address that because. Uh, Parking is a major problem. Yeah, we could use that in Brooklyn. Right yeah, yeah, I know. Okay. <laughs> or something I wonder, you know, when I think about so much this year, we've talked about artificial intelligence and generative AI, um, and some are concerned that it's going to take jobs away from people. I, I see it more as complementary. But having said that, I do think about job creation in the future because economies, whether it's the Gaza Strip, if people have a way to make a living and build a much more productive life, or whether it's in Israel or whether it's in other developing markets, if you can create a better life for yourself, it's just a better, more peaceful place, right? You can create an economy. So are there, I don't know, are we, are we moving increasingly towards a world though where technology is replacing jobs at a faster pace than we can make them? Unless you're a coder. <laughs> you know, I think that I hear that for the last 50 years I or know, so, right? I know. And so, 
So even if you think of the you, the revolution of agriculture that we started to have tractors and combines and different machinery, and everyone said, "Oh, this is going to take away the the work of the farmers." And guess what? It didn't, right? So every time that there is an innovation, we tell ourselves, oh, this is going to take away all the jobs. And then you look at the unemployment rate and it doesn't change or maybe it's becoming better because what happened is that the technology, by and large, increased productivity. And when it increased productivity, then we can create more. And when we create more, then more people actually have a better life. So you're not worried about AI being the end of us all? Not at all. What I think that we might find out that there are some areas that we will need to establish regulation, right? So, so if I'm speaking with a person, then that's one thing. But if I don't know that I'm speaking to a machine, it might be a different thing. So maybe the machine will need to identify itself and tell me I'm a machine, machine. right? Right. And, and be clear about it. And uh, and this is something that I think that eventually we will need to have. Do you think that? AI is close, as Elon Musk believes, to becoming smarter than humans? Wow, that's a big pause. No, no, (laughs) I think that we hear that for the last 50 years. Oh, computers are going to be smarter than people. Oh, we don't need people. We don't need the human brain. The human brain has something that... Yeah, but there was no no NVIDIA 50 years uh, ago. Right, but but then, um, you know, end of the day, I think that the creativity... And the adaptability is something that uh, only humans would have. And at the end of the day, um, that part is not going to be taken away. Now, whether or not you can scan way more information in a fraction of the second, absolutely yes. Whether or not you can process some of the things way faster, yes. But not the same order of magnitude what uh, the human mind can do. 30 seconds left. We've talked about a lot. Um, And obviously, it's a very stressful world right now. Final thoughts that you want to leave our audience as we get ready for a new year? So um, I think that... uh, In just about 30 seconds, sorry. Value creation, right? Value creation. When you create value, and value, by the way, you create for others, not for yourself. If we think about value creation, then we end up with a purpose to our life. And when we end up with a purpose to our life, we're going to be happier, and live longer, and the world is going to be a better place. Thank you so much. Thank Happy you. New Year. Happy Let's hope New Year. the new year is a calmer one, more peaceful one, and better one way It forward. will be. Okay. Ori Levine, uh, thank you so much. Always appreciate it. Co-founder of Waze and so much more. Um, as we talk about, we've talked about his book, Fall in Love with the Problem, Not the Solution, a Handbook for Entrepreneurs. He has it on his T-shirt for those who are watching. <laughs> You're listening to the Bloomberg Business Week podcast. Catch us live weekday afternoons from 3 to 6 Eastern. Listen on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, and the Bloomberg Business app. Or watch us live on YouTube. Fly me to the moon. Let me play up there with those stars. A little Frank for you, a little blue eyes. You know why we're talking about space and the moon? I do. Because it's, it's the next frontier. For drug manufacturing, perhaps. Yeah, it's really interesting. Uh, this story uh, is in the forthcoming issue of Bloomberg Business Week magazine. I want to read a little bit from it because it's, it's so good. Retinitis pigmentosa is a genetic cause of blindness. Some people know it as RP. There's no cure or treatment for it right now, mm-hmm. uh, but there's a startup that's working on it, uh, and it has big plans to develop the world's first protein-based artificial retina, which could help patients who have RP. Here's the thing. Manufacturing the retina involves depositing 200 paper-thin layers of a light-sensitive protein in a polymer mesh. Sounds pretty difficult, right? Yeah. Uh, Well, it turns out the protein layers must be perfectly even for the retina to work properly, and that's really difficult to do here on planet Earth. Right. So the company has turned to the International Space Station in the hopes that microgravity there could help Incredible story. Um, Robert Langrith is healthcare reporter for Bloomberg News. And in the forthcoming issue of Bloomberg Business Week, he writes about drug companies that are exploring making the most lucrative drugs in space. You can read his story now on the Bloomberg and at Bloomberg.com slash Business Week. Also here with us, the editor of Bloomberg Business Week, Joel Weber, here in our Bloomberg Interactive Broker Studio. Tim and I read this and we're like, Bob gets to do the coolest stories. <laughs> it's always one of those stories although, where like, oh my God. Although, Joel, I don't think he got to go on the ISS to do this. Uh, I mean, yeah, what's up with we'll, that? We'll, we'll, you know, it, it's kind of in a precarious situation, this thing with the U.S. and Russia. Anyway, the... Uh, Elon, the, Elon, just go to Elon. <laughs> yeah, SpaceX exactly. could send him there. Um, 
Bob, you, you heard it from these guys. You have permission <laughs> so, to ask at least. Um, uh, so we're, we decided to do a little space package. Um, there's a lot happening up there, it turns out. Yeah. And there are some expected things like what SpaceX is up to and the race to catch them. But there's also, I thought, some more interesting things of like applications that you've probably never heard of. And it turns out that, you know, you mentioned microgravity there. There are some novel uh, use cases for what can be accomplished in space. So, so Bob, walk us through it. What is, uh, what can we do in space that we can't do as well here on Earth? Yeah. So it turns out, you know, a lot of the drugs that drug makers are making these days are, are proteins, or things like monoclonal antibodies or cancer drugs, and these are that are that are infused, and these are you know complicated finicky molecules that are notoriously difficult to produce on Earth in their crystal form. So it turns out that without gravity or without much gravity, you know, it becomes much. It's much easier uh, to form like a large, uh, large and very uniform crystals. And that, as it turns out, can enhance formulations and even potentially some uh, existing drugs. So drug maker Merck, it's working. It's worked on a new formulation of its just blockbuster cancer drug Keytruda. Now that's a cancer drug that Jimmy Carter got. It's for like melanoma and all sorts of other ones. But right now. It must be infused, like you have to go to a doctor's office and infused over a couple hours. Uh, and the dry, it would really like to put that in an injectable form, as you could do just a self-administered injection, potentially even at home. But to do that, it needs to be able to concentrate. That could treat it much more like be concentrated now. And if you did it with the current formulation, it would get like molasses. So it turns out they did some experiments in space in the International Space Station, and they came up with a way to concentrate it much more and keep it fast flowing. And those experiments using microgravity, those Oops, a little bit of freezing. We're going to try and unfreeze him and then bring Bob back. Oh, there he is. Form. Yep, hi. It's Go like ahead. you're joining us from the International Space Station. <laughs> we, for like Bobby's actual, nice you know. Done. Please yeah. pause for... <laughs> we, we want it to be <laughs> realistic, Bob. I'm sorry. Continue ahead, about continue. The, about Keytruda. I'm, I'm sorry. I got a thing saying my internet connection was unstable. I haven't gotten that all day until I... Remember, that's how, remember the pandemic? <laughs> yeah, we're <laughs> <yeah, exactly. laughs> that way. Don't worry about it. Hours here, no problem. That's the first time. <laughs> um, yeah, so Mark is working on a new formulation of Keytruda. It's, it's big selling drug uh, that was uh, kind of first, uh, the concept for it was first devised in space. And, and the fact that they might go into clinical trials is something that was dev first, uh, you know, devised in space. That's excited a lot of, uh, gotten a lot of interest in, you know, space-based uh, drug development. Uh, and other companies like Eli Lilly is up there with some experiments now. And you even now have startups that once the uh, International Space Station is decommissioned, you know, sometime after 2030, that are working on developing, you know, automated kind of drug formulation laboratories in, in space that so would send some experiment up and then it would come back down and uh, drug companies could work on it. Okay, so when does this happen? Why don't we have this already, Bob? Well, you know, th these are all kind of like, you know, I, I like to say these are all kind of like early experiments. So say so their drug companies have been sending up experiments, by the way, out into space for really for decades. And their, their first experiments were kind of like early stage aimed at like uh, early stage drug crystallization where they crystallize got disease promote, promoting protein so they could design better drugs. And in fact, uh, a unit of Atsuka Holdings, that's a Japanese company, they have a drug in final stage trials in Japan for muscular dystrophy uh, that, was, that was based on some very early work, uh, you know, done early, in the early days of International Space Study, Space Station crystallizing a, a muscular dystrophy associated protein. But what's happening now is they're actually uh, Merck and some others are showing you could actually devise, you know, better formulations of existing blockbuster drugs. And that's really driven the attention to like maybe you know, space is like, you know, could really like help us get some new patents and make a lot of money. So that's really driven interest. So whose job is it to figure out how to do this in space? Like, you know, Tim, Tim, if you're going to make you know, car breaks in space. I'm sure you can figure that out. But Bob, what yeah, about... Yeah, you don't want to see how far I made it in math in, but, uh, in college. Drawing. But uh, but it, at, it, within pharma, like whose job is it to figure out space manufacturing? Yeah, so at the big, you know, drug makers, there's relatively, you know, small numbers of the people like working on it. So it's still a niche field. I'd say, you know, if you go to a big drug maker, I would imagine there's probably a lot more people working on AI than space. But, you know, you know space is like, you know garnering interest. Some of the people I talk to, their titles are like, you know, director of formulations development, the titles like that. Uh, but these experiments are, are hard, you know, you, you send something up to the space station and, you know, 
you get it back down a few months later and if you like uh, screwed up in the design of the experiment, you know, your next shot and next experiment may be, you know, six months later. So you gotta, you gotta, you gotta do it. Be very careful with experimental design. Cause you can't like, it's hard to call an astronaut and say, Hey, I want to change everything midstream once it's up there. So, so there's even a whole set of like companies that help drug makers, like have like self-enclosed experiments that can send up that are like all ready to go. The astronaut presses a couple buttons to turn it on and presses a couple buttons to turn it off. You know, you can't, it's hard to adjust the condition of midstream once you're up in space. <laughs> the button pressing job. It doesn't sound bad. Uh, so Bob, I want to get to this idea of scaling and make sure I understand what's actually happening in space. I want to go back to the the company that you used in the lead here, Lambda Vision, who's working on the world's first protein-based artificial retina for patients with retinitis pigmentosa. So if if it's so hard to actually create these 200 paper-thin layers of light-sensitive protein uh, in on Earth, does that mean that they won't be able to scale it in an environment that's not zero gravity? Yeah, so they're one of the few companies that's right now is talking about actually, as I understand it, manufacturing the finished product, you know, in space. And if you think about their product, it's like literally it's the size of like a, a hole punch, like a paper hole punch. That's like, you know, so you get, I guess you get one or two of these if you're a patient. Uh, so they don't need that much finished product. You know, it's a relatively small market. Uh, I mean, this is not like an infused drug where you're going to be giving, I don't know, 200 milliliters every two weeks for the rest of your life. That's more like Merck's K-Truda. They, they make it, Merck and K-Truda, their cancer drug, they make it like by the ton on Earth. Mm. And their experiments in space so far have made like one dose at a time. So you can see that it's not right now practical. Wouldn't be, even if there are, even though there are technical advantages, it would not be practical for them to make the finished product in space. But for something like this artificial retina, where the total quantities needed are very, very small, and I imagine if they ever get this to market, it's gonna be sold for a very high price. You know, you can imagine that's an actual like possibility to actually make that in space. Would you take the one dose that's been made in space, knowing that <laughs> there's massive quantities on Earth? It's it's yeah. practically the same thing. It's just been made in space. Like, why wouldn't yeah, you? Yeah, why wouldn't I do it? Why not? Okay. Yeah, yeah, why not? I, I don't know if I would. But. <laughs> you know, <never. laughs> it's a trick well, question. <laughs> that, that raises the re whole regulatory question. No one's even got to, like, you know, if something actually were made in space or even if, like, there's another idea they're talking about is making, like, a seed crystal in space. Use the better conditions of space to make, like, little seed crystals that they could then be used, sort of like a sourdough starter being brought down to cool. Earth and able to grow bigger quantities on Earth. But even there, like... <laughs> The FDA, how would the FDA regulate that? There's a whole, like, I guess, set of unknown like questions there. Yeah, FDA is not having any problems with oversight. We did that story actually earlier today. Um, having said that, how easy is it to duplicate the process of space drug or manufacturing drugs in space on Earth? Can we create that, recreate that? Yeah, so the way to think of it with some of these drug formulations are trying to make better, like easier to use injectable drug formulations. And the way, way to think about that is that there's just like, you know, there's a million conditions you can put in to get something to crystallize the temperature, the pressure, you know, the uh, the concentrations, many, many conditions. You can try almost an infinite number and just things form a little without the microgravity because crystals are these kind of slow forming finicky things. And without the, the convection is one of the things that goes away, the fluid convection. So uh, and that's reduced and that gets better. It just gets better quality crystals for, in many cases. And so the way to think about it is they, they get an idea in space like, in these better conditions. And then once they uh, know what they're looking for, they then find you find a way to duplicate that back at the factory here on Earth. And that's what Merck did with this new formulation of K-Truda that may go into clinical trials. Okay, so so Merck seems to be all over this. What about other drug manufacturers? Are you know, are, is there really a a race like as often as the case in space? Space race for space drugs. Space race for drugs, <laughs> or or is well, everybody so else Merck just conceding? Has a competitor. Yeah, yeah, space race. So Merck Merck has a competitor in cancer drugs, and that's Bristol Myers Squibb. And they make a rival to K-Truda called, called Obdivo, and they indeed are putting experiments up into space, uh, like, you know, looking at protein crystallization, you know, and, uh, you know, they, they do say it includes cancer, but they won't say which drugs and are involved. But all I can say is they, they do make a direct rival to K-Truda. So, 
you know, drug companies, you know, historically, you know, once one company does something, you know, the others want to try it out. They're, Wait, you know, not like gonna... a dry, a diet <laughs> drug or anything. <laughs> yeah. So, well, so far, I've not heard of any diet no, drugs, no. you know, that made in space. But, uh, uh, you know, I'll keep reporting. We should make journalism in space. Just just, just so, so that we Are you can. volunteering to go? I mean, you know, Bob, Bob was already going to go check Are it out. So I, 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 most cost effectively. Bob, see if that corporate card yeah, exactly. will cover that uh, SpaceX <laughs> that trip, okay? Hey, listen, I hate to be a, a bummer on all of this, but isn't the International Space Station at risk of being decommissioned after 2030? So, like, does that put kind of a damper on all of this? Well, there's companies like, you know, there's like private startups and companies like working on like what's after the space station. There's one small one, you know, startup that actually has like a little satellite that's like a little drug production lab. They hope it's going to be a little automated drug formulation production lab up there now for their first mission. They have had some problems getting the uh, reentry capsule back down because they need FAA, Federal Aviation uh, Administration uh, permission, they haven't been able to get it yet. So it illustrates some of like, you know, the potential snags uh, involved in space-based production. Yeah. Okay. Well, we know where Big Pharma is, which is the final frontier, you know? Uh, I'm curious to see if, <laughs> if this is for real, though. I mean, like, sure, you can make a couple applications, right. but scale seems maybe not easy to get there. Tim's going to try the, brake pads and report back. But the payoff is uh, is potentially huge here. I mean, if you can cure blindness with artificial retinas, like even though Bob says it's a relatively small number of people, I mean, people would pay so much for that. And all you need is, you know, some microgravity. Yeah. That's, what's there. Yeah, I, I, That's why it's I, there I, for I think, you. I, I think the key word we use in the headline was that the drug companies are exploring this, you know. Yeah, like all right, all right. Not all a done right, deal. And, all right. you know, I think the way to think of it, they're doing experiments up there that, that are going to help help them, you know, devise new formulations and new versions of their drugs, but it doesn't necessarily mean those are going to actually, those final drugs are actually going to be produced in space. And I think we call think that the to be sure graph. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. in, in or the third word in that line. <laughs> well, I'm just going to say thank you, Bob, because I've been just saying drugs in space all day. <laughs> so, it sounds really cool. It does sound really cool. I'm very interesting uh, in terms of uh, maybe what we could see down the road. Bob Langreth, thank you so much. Everything you do is just, uh, we learned something and it's a fun read and an interesting read. Healthcare reporter here at Bloomberg News on Zoom in San Francisco. He is not on the International Space Station. So as far as we know, yeah, despite know. the fact that there were some internet connectivity yeah. issues. But yeah. yeah. You never know. Really, really interesting stuff. I'll be the guy who presses the buttons, Joel. <laughs> that sounds like a good We job can fight too. over it, maybe. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Joel already has it. Joel Weber, of course, the editor of Bloomberg Business Week. Check this out in the upcoming new issue of Bloomberg Business Week. It's also online. I'm driving in my car, I turn on the radio. Yeah, how about you let me drive? Oh, no, 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 no. Who's gonna drive you home? Honey, please, I'll do the driving. Drive on. Excuse me, I want to drive. You drive it's the question that drives us. This is the drive to the close. That funky music will drive us till the dawn. On Bloomberg Radio. All right, everybody, just uh, about 17 minutes left in today's trading session right here on Bloomberg Business Week. Carol Master along with Tim Stenovic. Hey, Tim, among our most read on the Bloomberg, it's one about the message coming from Wall Street about investor optimism running dangerously high. Uh, it points about uh, or it points to overstretched technicals and the belief that the Fed will not cut interest rates as quickly as markets expect um, are behind a pessimistic turn from equity specialists over JP Morgan Chase, Morgan Stanley. I mean, people uh, are just kind of... Kind of slow your roll a little bit, I mean, it's been, a, it's been a kind of a wild five or six weeks, hasn't it? As Goldman Sachs... Well, that's the point, right? Yeah. Managing Director Scott Rubner put it in a report. There are, quote, no longer any bears left. It's pretty amazing. Let's see what our Drive to the Close guest has to say about that. With us, back with us is Aaron Kennan, CEO over at Clear Harbor Asset Management. He's co-founder of the firm. They've got about a billion in assets under management. He joins us on Zoom from Stanford, Connecticut. Aaron, good to have you back with us. Are there any bears left? Well, that's a great question. If you look at the underbelly of the market, Carol and Tim, I mean, certainly there, there's a lot of caution, I think, that that can be seen. You know, look at the 493 stocks outside the S&P 500's Magnificent 7. They're only up a few percentage points on a year-to-date basis, and uh, those seven stocks are up about 97%. So I think there's a tale of two stories going on across the market, even even global indices for that matter. You look at 
the all world index and it's about 18 percent allocated to the magnificent seven and so um pe multiples on those 493 stocks are trading at about 16 times or so and the magnificent seven are trading trailing at about 50 times hmm. and so maybe that's the glass half full point that you know the rest of the market even though we haven't seen much of a, a move higher from a per performance perspective this year could have could have some legs in 2024 if the economic picture is uh, relatively okay. Do you think the economic picture is going to be relatively okay next year? Well, I think a lot hinges, Tim, on employment. You know, we saw the JOLTS data today um, weaker than expected, but, you know, certainly still relatively strong. Jobless claims have trended downward on a trend line basis, but still relatively strong. And uh, we'll have a read through on the, on the jobs data too. Uh, and so, uh, uh, and the jobless uh, non-farm payrolls data too uh, later on so uh, in the week. So um, I think a lot will hinge on the employment picture. If the GDP uh, and economic data set more generally rolls over and we go into a more recessionary-like period in 2024 from multiple quarters, even if we have a disinflationary um, continuation with the Fed cutting rates, I think that's probably bad for equities. But I think that there's a scenario that could very well play out where growth remains positive, maybe trends lower, but positive, um, and disinflation continues. Uh, that, that, that could be very bullish for both bonds and potentially uh, equities where that correlation remains uh, positive in 24. Is that likely? Might it happen? Where where would you place your bet in terms of the scenario for next year? Or do you feel like it's kind of up for grabs right now? I mean, I think it's somewhat up for grabs, but I would just, you know, a point of caution is employment is the last leg of the stool that tends to break as we enter a recessionary mm -hmm. period. Um, and be, that has just started to soften on the margin here, while other data sets, Carol, like manufacturing and some indications on the consumer, whether it's credit card lines. Um, I mean, just the uh, student loan repayments just restarted at the end of October. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's still some um, negative headwinds that are going to work through the pipeline as we enter 2024, which is also why I think we should expect uh, at least a deceleration in GDP. What are some other reasons? Uh, other reasons for? Yeah, for a deceleration in GDP. Well, I mean, you look at China, uh, Tim, uh, good good example. Uh, this year, as we waded into 2023, everyone thought, well, China's going to reopen in the back half of 2023 is going to be all about China exporting inflation and exporting growth and and, and economic activity. I think that's a big question mark for the overall uh, global economy, uh, frankly. Um, my, my sense is, just looking at the, the data set there, that things are, are quite weak. You look at uh, personal bankruptcy data in China, is skyrocketing. You look at the real estate picture on the commercial side in China and the delinquencies and defaults happening there, it's a rather significant problem. They tried to it, transition their economy from an export-driven economy to a consumer uh, growth, domestic growth driven economy. And clearly that has proven very problematic in 2023. And so that'll be a huge question mark as we go into 2024. How much, hmm, uh, in terms of portfolio allocation, and I'm assuming, you know, Aaron, we've talked, you know, for a long time, you know, you set things and I'm assuming for a lot of your clients, it, it stays pretty consistent. Um, but having said that, I'm sure there are tweaks. Is there a tweak to be made right now as we get ready to enter a new year in, in your investment strategies? Yeah, it's a good question, Carol. I mean, you're right. We do care deeply about asset allocation and, and, and thinking, though, about the fundamentals of each asset class does inform us uh, as to when we think a tilting may be warranted or even within an asset class, an adjustment may be warranted. So, for example, even in fixed income, we went into 2023 and it looked like very short maturity high yield was worth allocating to, even though the correlation is high to the equity market. Mm -hmm. And so on the margin became a little more constructive on high yield in 23. In 24, we have a similar posture um, on that particular point because we don't see high yield issuance for um, for refinance occurring really into two, until 2025 and 26. We're gonna have about $1.8 trillion of refis happening in high yield mm -hmm. over the next three years. but. It's, it's, it's captured on the back end. But maybe the most important point is 
ensuring that there is ballast in the portfolio, particularly if economic growth declines and disinflation continues, you want to ensure that you not only have uh, the treasuries and agency mor mortgage-backed securities, in our opinion, but you want to make sure you have sufficient amount of duration to counteract what could be a weaker equity market environment. And so, yeah. you know, those slight adjustments we're always thinking about making, uh, obviously in conjunction with conversations with clients and their liquidity needs and that sort of thing. Well, certainly helpful as we get ready to close out the year. Um, not sure if we'll see you before the end of the year, but if we don't, happy holidays and happy new year, Aaron. Uh, so appreciate it. Aaron Kennan, uh, CEO and co-founder at Clear Harbor Asset Management, uh, joining us on Zoom from Stanford, Connecticut. This is the Bloomberg Business Week podcast, available on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Listen live weekday afternoons from 3 to 6 Eastern on Bloomberg.com, the iHeartRadio app, tune in, and the Bloomberg Business app. You can also watch us live every weekday on YouTube and always on the Bloomberg Terminal.